I am. I'm Professor Caitlin Dwyer in the theology department, and I am helping facilitate a three-part series on the history and mission in Thomas More. And the goal is just to help us grow as a community and an understanding of our history and mission so we can better live it out. So in session one, we focused on the history of Thomas More. And today we're gonna pivot to talk more about the mission of Thomas More University. And I'm sure you've all probably heard it a million times, but I'm just gonna go ahead and read it once more. So we're all on the same page here. Thomas More University is the Catholic Liberal Arts University of the Diocese of Covington, Kentucky. Inspired by the Catholic intellectual tradition, we challenge students of all faiths to examine the ultimate meaning of life, their place in the world, and their responsibility to others. Okay, so today we're gonna to be focusing on two things, two aspects of our Catholic mission. First, we're going to hear from Father Twadell, and he's going to help us understand what the Catholic intellectual tradition is, because we probably all heard that phrase, but sometimes it can be a little tricky to wrap our minds around what exactly that means. And we're not alone in that. If you do a little research on that topic online, you'll find people have different ways of explaining what it is. So Father Twiddell is going to shed light on that topic for us, or many of you know him, but a couple of you are new. Uh, so he is a professor in the philosophy department. He's also our school chaplain. And his areas of expert, expertise are many, but they include applied ethics, theory of values, philosophy of religion, philosophy of education, philosophy of history, and philosophy of law. He also teaches intro courses on Latin here. He has many degrees, uh, but I just wanted to highlight he did his graduate work at the Catholic University of Paris, including a master's of philosophy and a doctorate of philosophy as well. And uh, Father Twadell, if I got any of that incorrect, please feel free to correct me. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to him so I'm gonna mute myself, Father Twaddell, and when you start speaking, you should pop up full screen so everybody can see you. All right, very good. So uh, I just want to say, uh, please do not be impressed with a bunch of degrees. Uh, that's just from hanging around too many universities for too long. Uh, in any case, I, uh, I do want to say something about where this whole business of Catholic intellectual tradition begins because I would want to claim that it begins before the church, that it has its roots in the Hebrew people who themselves developed all kinds of interests in an intellectual life. Uh, you, you can remember the case where the uh, Hebrew people were taken into exile, and King, Nebuch King Nebuchadnezzar told his officials that he wanted them to go and find a number of the very well-educated uh, young men of the Hebrew people that he could retrain, teaching them the new language, the laws, and so forth, so that they could serve in his uh, his administration. That's a rather important indication that there was already a tradition of intellectual activity. Look also at the poetry, the art, and so forth that those people uh, engaged with in ancient times. When you come up to the apostolic times, to the time of Jesus himself, we also see a number of things that are going on, uh, again, in the Hebrew world. In Alexandria, there was a, an important young philosopher named Philo of Alexandria, who was working at 
showing a concordance between the teachings of Plato and the teachings of Judaism. He was well known, and even back in Jerusalem, there was constant uh, interchange, communication back and forth. Gamaliel, one of the great Nazi of, uh, of that time, was in constant touch with the people in Alexandria, where there was a large uh, Hebrew com component. So those ideas were floating back and forth. When you look at the writings of St. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, we need to remember that Tarsus was a major place for the study of Stoicism and the study of rhetoric. You might call it a center for communication studies. And while <laughs> Paul refers uh, several times to his not speaking with great uh, rhetoric and so forth. Uh, I, I think you have to take that with uh, a grain of salt because I think he's saying it with tongue in cheek in many instances. And he is very well acquainted with literature of the Greeks. So when he is at Athens and trying to proclaim the word of God there, he references poetry of the ancient Greeks, citing it. Uh, and he also shows, for example, in his uh, letter to the Colossians, uh, an awareness of Neoplatonic ideals. Uh, even the words that he uses, the, the terminology, uh, when he talks about the uh, thrones and dominations and powers and all of that, those are terms in use in Neoplatonic uh, cosmology. So he has a clear understanding and he wants to engage people where they are with their already formed intellectual background. You can even go uh, to the uh, fourth gospel and look at the way the author even begins. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was before God, and God was the Logos. This was in principle before God. That word Logos is one of the major terms of Greek philosophy, especially Neoplatonic philosophy. And what the fourth gospel wants to make sure that we understand is that that Logos became flesh pitched his tent among us. In other words, God is not far off. God is not a stranger to the human condition. God is one of us. That's a major uh, approach. Again, you find all throughout the fourth gospel, the basis for what would later be one of uh, St. Paul's concerns, the Gnostics who were distorting the message of Jesus, who were distorting who Jesus was. And so when Paul is denouncing various heresies, that is what he is talking about. The same kind of thing that St. John, or the author of the fourth gospel, is referring to. All through the early years of the church, you see that same concern over and over. We have to encounter the people of the Gentile world on their own terms. And you see Christian thinkers from the earliest days who know thoroughly what that thought is about, and they embrace it. They are not afraid of it. They are not thinking that they are going to be corrupted by it. They want to know and so Justin the martyr attempts to engage the emperor uh, Aurelius and he writes to him in specifically philosophical terms that the emperor will understand in defense of the Christians. Now he became a martyr, so he wasn't necessarily successful, but again, he was setting out to do it on the emperor's terms. The emperor, by the way, of course, was a well-known philosopher. 
you go on through the years you come up to the to the uh third century end of the second century beginning of the third century you find origin who is leading the school of religion founded by saint mark in alexandria and he is one of the most prominent scholars in scripture studies probably the first really serious scripture scholar in the church and he also at the school of religion offers people who are prepared and interested instruction in the liberal arts the greek liberal arts teaching them greek literature greek logic greek philosophy greek science the whole bundle of things that are part of the liberal arts still today you go up a bit later you come to tertullian and he's famous for his statement you know or the question what has athens to do with jerusalem and yet he too is thoroughly versed in all of the pagan literature he is thoroughly versed in greek philosophy roman thought all of it and he draws on it his his uh treatise on the soul could just as easily have been written by somebody a thousand years later in the Middle Ages. Uh, it is thoroughly versed in philosophy. Now, this is the beginning of the Catholic intellectual tradition, and it touches on everything. Art, music, drama, science, everything. And through the centuries, that continues on. We can never forget that it was the Catholic Church that created the university systems that we still recognize today. The first of those was the University of Padua, and then came the University of Paris, and after that the University of Oxford, and back and forth, and up and down the continent of Europe, universities, Studia Generale, were cre being created. All of those people, these members of various religious orders who taught in those places, were carrying on bringing forward this Catholic intellectual tradition that we are part of today. It goes right through the opening of the modern era. It comes right on through all of the sciences, the scientific discoveries, we tend to forget that people like Copernicus was not just a great physicist, he was a Catholic priest. Galileo, we remember mainly for his great problems, held several, several canonries. He was a church official. That's why he was more subject to uh, the concerns of those people. He was attacked by other mathematicians, not theologians. He was attacked by other mathematicians who were upset because his courses were more popular than theirs. He is part of that intellectual tradition. You come all the way through the Middle Ages, you come up to more recent times, you look in the, in the 19th century, at the uh, at Pierre and Marie uh, Curie and their work in chemistry and physics. Again, these are Catholic thinkers. They are part of the Catholic intellectual tradition. You can go now and look at the religious background of Nobel Prize winners since the Nobel Prize was instituted, and you will be amazed at how many Nobel Prize winners in a variety of areas, more I think in literature, but nonetheless in many areas of, of science as, as well, who are Nobel Prize winners. This is the Catholic intellectual tradition. Notice that I have not said anything about theology. Theology is a part of that Catholic intellectual tradition, but it isn't all there is. It is one portion. 
there are all kinds of other issues that Catholic thinkers have dealt with through the ages. And this is what we are about. We are part of it. And I regard our connection with the Catholic intellectual tradition to be the most important thing that we have to offer. This is what sets us apart from other institutions. A Catholic university is handing on the Catholic intellectual tradition. It is bringing new people into that tradition, forming them so that they will in turn be able to hand that on to future generations still. Our participation in the Catholic intellectual tradition is the best we have to offer. And it's the most exciting thing we have to offer. If we don't understand that, if we don't give it enough attention, if we let it fall by the wayside, we may as well take the word Catholic off the name of the university and just go about our business selling a different product. It is what we have to offer. And we should be proud of this tradition, proud that we are part of it, and delighted to be able to share it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Taddell. And I want to open it up now to questions. Uh, and that can uh, touch, these questions can touch on anything that Father Twaddell has brought up or anything that was in the material that I sent out. Our goal is just to help all of us grow in our understanding of what this tradition is and how it informs what we do here. So does anyone have any questions that they want to ask Father Twaddell about this? Everybody's afraid to ask. Well, uh, I'll get us started. I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit how, at a concrete level, this influences our curriculum. So obviously, we have the core, and that's part of our uh, identity as a liberal arts college, too, that we have students take uh, classes, courses in a variety of disciplines so that they get a sense of the whole of knowledge. But how specifically does that having that course steeped in the Catholic intellectual tradition result in a, a different kind of education that you would see at like a secular liberal, liberal arts school? Well, I think basically it, it is essential that we have that liberal arts foundation. Uh, and I think that people who teach any of those liberal arts courses come to it with an openness of thinking, of an attitude towards learning that is essential to this Catholic intellectual tradition. And that is that we are open to following the truth wherever it leads us. And th again, there's nothing particularly new about that. Um, for example, you can go and look at the, uh, at the writings of Thomas Aquinas, and he is saying that that is something we must do. We must pursue the truth wherever it leads. Unlike a more narrow uh, career-focused uh, type of uh, curriculum where the interest is not so much in pursuing truth, but in pursuing the efficient operation uh, of a person in a particular uh, area of the marketplace. We are trying to form people, whole people, in every dimension of their reality. And I don't think that it matters whether a particular professor happens to be a Catholic or not. The very fact that they are teaching in a Catholic institution already indicates their own 
interest in and willingness to cooperate in this pursuit of truth and this kind of uh, commitment to forming people to be you know, good, whole people who will be citizens of the world, who will be people and, and able to engage with, empowered to function in the world in a very wide uh, set of, uh, of ways. Uh, you know, I have, I've attended uh, several different uh, state universities here and in Europe. And, uh, you know, what, what is essential there too is often this commitment to the pursuit of truth. We bring that Catholic identity to it, but that doesn't undermine or transform it in any other way. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean that we cut off discussion of important topics that we feel uncomfortable with. It means that we remain open, open in every possible way to the pursuit of truth. Does that help? Yes. And I think that last point you made about openness is really important that it, at a Catholic university, we're, we're not trying to see less or, or look at less. Our, our Catholic background, our heritage helps us be open to more, the, the fullness of the truth. So we don't shy away from any question. It's just a, a different way of looking at those questions, I think, in light of both faith and reason. I think that's a common misunderstanding that Catholic identity uh, is narrowing versus uh, an expansive worldview that helps us see more. So I do think that's helpful. Uh, Judy Chris has a question she put in the chat here. Do you know when the term Catholic intellectual tradition was first used? I'm sorry, I can't say exactly. I think it is a term that has gained currency mainly in the 20th century and uh, probably uh, more in the second half of the 20th century. And yet, you know, the same, the same basic issues and ideas are those that you find in uh, the idea of a university uh, by uh, John Henry, well, St. John Henry uh, Newman. Uh, it's the same, the same claims, the same kind of uh, interest as he lays out what what a university should be. And he isn't talking specifically about a Catholic university. It's just a university. Um, and and that, that connects also with something else more recently uh, during the time of uh, Pope St. John Paul II. Uh, there are documents that were coming out of Rome saying a Catholic university must first and foremost be a university. It must be intellectually just as solid as any other university. The fact that it is Catholic is simply adding another dimension of its connection to the church and the church's mission of evangelization. It's not, uh, it's not some other kind of thing. Uh, it, it's not a, an ersatz university. It is really, truly a university doing the work of a university. Seeking, seeking the truth. Uh, are, are there any other questions? You can put them in the chat or unmute to ask them to Father Twaddell. One analogy that's been helpful for me to understanding what the Catholic intellectual tradition is, is thinking of it like a family tradition. And there's two parts. There's passing down these great works that these intellectual giants have produced in their engagement with the world. Father Twaddell mentioned some of them, like Galileo, like the Curies, like uh, Dante and other giants of literature. But then it's also an ongoing tradition that's continuing to, to be developed. So our professors here at Thomas More are working within it. We're inviting our students into it. It's a form of inquiry 
guided by certain principles like the harmony of faith and reason, for example, that's continuing to be developed. So there's this aspect of the past, it's something that we're receiving, that we're passing on, but then there's also a present and a future. It's something we're continuing to develop and create and participate in. So Father Twadell, I don't know if you agree that's a apt analogy. It's just helped me make it a little more concrete for myself as I've learned more about it. No, that, that sounds fine to me. Um, I just add, you know, if anyone does have any other questions later, uh, don't hesitate to, to ask. Uh, this is sort of a passion of mine. Uh, so uh, do feel free anytime. Hey, Father Twiddell, I do have one question. How do you think we've got some new um, employees on, on the call today? How do you think they can concretely live out the mission in their work? I mean, do you have any advice for new employees, how they can help? I'm sorry, I, I missed part of your question. It's my uh, speaker here is sort of tinny sometimes. Okay. We have some new employees, um, Father Twiddell, mm -hmm. and um, how would you, what advice would you give them as to how they can live out our mission? All right, so first and foremost, uh, I think the main thing for any employee of Thomas More is to strive to lead a good life as a uh, person committed to uh, ethical practice, uh, respect for human dignity in any and all shapes, respect for every other person that you encounter, always, and, and I, I want to say more than respect, I want to say reverence for every person. Uh, if we all work together as members of a community uh, that has a common purpose of passing on this intellectual tradition to new generations of students year in and year out, then I think that everything that a person does can be shaped by that and it can be carried out in a very simple way. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to go and read a stack of books about it. It's more a question of entering into a way of living and thinking about one another. All should be uh, embraced in that same perspective. Uh, I mean, interestingly, uh, the encyclical Fratelli Tutti that uh, Pope Francis just issued on Sunday is about essentially the same thing. Seeing every person as a neighbor, every person as a brother or sister in Christ. That is the essential thing. We need to build a community in which that is always the basic rule of action. 